chapter 7, verses 10 through 12. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. You're not going to put the Lord to the test. Now, that's in Scripture. Go back to Deuteronomy, right? You should not put your Lord to God to test. But it's a little bit different when God says, come test me. It's a whole different thing. God's ask the Lord your God. Being specifically told, ask me. Ask me to prove what I'm saying to you. So, why would Ahaz refuse? Well, he was afraid. He saw the things in the world. He saw the challenges that faced him. And possibly he didn't really want to necessarily hear the answer. The next verse in verse 13. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? God wants us He has open arms to receive us. He wants to hear our prayers. He wants to hear the things that we're excited about. He wants to hear the things that we're concerned about. And I think one of the important things to understand is when we ask for a sign, when we ask for a test, there's, there's two different ways in which that happens. What we really want is God to confirm what he's calling us to do. Ahaz missed the boat on that. We live in a world that, where it's really hard sometimes to distinguish right and wrong, true and false. You know, what does it look like and where is it? And I don't know, have you read your Bible lately? Does the world back then seem like the world today? It doesn't, does it? I mean, it doesn't seem like it was back in biblical times. First of all, your cars out there look a lot nicer than donkeys, and I'm sure you're all happy to ride in your cars as opposed to donkeys. But our world is different. However, in some ways, it is exactly the same. Because God is God. Jesus is Jesus. And we are still human beings. Feelings, thoughts. We may be learned more throughout the years, but the essential part of who we are as human beings is no different than anybody back then. So, how do we know when it's God's will? Well, let's uh, prepare ourselves to hear and to think by praying together. If you would, oh God, oh God, oh God. open my heart and my mind. Open my heart and my mind. So I can hear your word. So I can hear your word. And know your will for my life. And know your will for my life. Then give me the courage. And give me the courage. To go from this place. To go from this, this place. And live it. And live it. Amen. Amen. So how do I know? As I click on the slide, you'll see. Uh, 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 I have a sense of humor about this. It's okay. So, number one. So how do I know? I mean, how do I know? Well, there's three key ways in which we know that God is speaking to us, that God is trying to bring us a message. The first one is we know because of God's own confirmation. When you go to the Old Testament reading talking about Gideon, that story is really amazing, and it's a really amazing story of faith. But here, Gideon... In, in the verses we read, we're talking about the fleece. Do you all remember that about the fleece? And he basically gives God two tests. Now, why is he giving him a test? Oh, look, see, now I can't click. No, no, I can't click. Never mind. That's comical. He, he asks God for two tests. Now, why is he asking to test God? What's, what's Gideon really trying to get at? Is he trying to test that God is God? No. His test is to get God to confirm to him 
that what he is saying is true. Is God, is this what you want me to do? Is this what you're calling me to do? And actually, in the broader sense of the story, it starts even before that, where when God's angel first appeared. And one of the things Gideon said was, just wait here. Let me go get a sacrifice and bring it to you. You are truly God. You are truly calling me to be the leader and to, and to, to lead our people. Then let me go. Get the preparations for a sacrifice and come, come give a sacrifice to you. That was the first one. And then, if you remember Gideon's story, after the fleece, he goes and assembles the army. And I love this part. God says you got too many people. Excuse me? I mean, is that a moment to kind of knock it? Excuse me, God, what? I have too many people to go fight this for? Yeah. So you got to send them home. Send a bunch of them home. And then you know what God tells him? You still have too many people. God shrinks it down to 300 people. That's it. And you know what one of the things God said to Gideon was? He said, you have too many people. Because what will happen is the people will all think of how they did this and forget about their reliance on me. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But God's confirmation. God can confirm to you. Do you believe God can speak to you? I mean, God can thunder right now and speak to you directly. God can whisper to you. I think one of the things that's, that's really important to understand is that in God's confirmation, He's given us some ways to talk and speak and to be with Him. Let me give you just a couple. John Wesley talks about means of grace, and there are five means of grace that he talks about. One is prayer. Prayer is a means of grace. It is something God has given us so that we can communicate that we can share our concerns. And probably most importantly, when we're sharing those concerns and we're asking those questions, God, is this the direction you want me to go? God, is this what you want me to do? The thing that everybody forgets about in prayer is that you've got to stop and then listen. But he gives us prayer for that communication. Two, searching the scripture. When we look at needing to find an answer, searching the scripture, seeing what God's word is, has been and what it is can help us to understand. Today is World Communion Sunday, and one of the means of grace that's been blessed to us is communion. Holy Communion is our time to commune with God. It is the Spirit that is here with us. The fourth means of grace is Christian conflict. You can't fly solo in this world, because if you fly solo in this world, you're going to get gobbled up. As Christians following Jesus Christ, we have brothers and sisters, not just here, but all around the world, that believe in Jesus and what he has done for us. For us, where we live right now, Christian conference means when we get an idea or a thought, and we think maybe God's speaking to us, we have other mature Christians that we can go and talk to. We can conference with them, bounce those ideas. In my journey to be at this point right now, it was several spiritually developed Christian friends that helped me work through this, to understand, is this really God's call for my life? And I want to point this out too. One of my closest, most respected friends, for quite some time, tried to talk me out of it. Tried to tell me that where I was at was a mission field as well, which was true. That I was needed there. Maybe. But God's call was something different. And through time, he as well affirmed that for me. And lastly, fasting. Coming to a point of spiritual discipline. Fasting doesn't mean that you're starving yourself to death. Fasting means that you are putting the importance of God and God's word before your own physical. And in that spiritual moment, in doing that, that helps to allow God to confirm the messages that he is trying to give us. Remind yourself in all of this, 
in a very, very important part, is that you have to be seeking Him. You have to be seeking God's will. It can't be about what you want to go do later. You have to be really thinking about, God, what is your will for me right now? What do you need me to do? Where do you need me to be? I'll go back to, to, to the point with Ahaz and the difference in terms of how we're asking and seeking. You don't want to put the Lord your God to test. Even Jesus said that in response to the devil, right? I'm not going to just do something so God can prove he's God. That's not the point. But God is calling us. He calls us to a couple spots. Number one, test me with your giving. He says, trust me. Test me in this. And I will bless you. But he also, as you saw through Gideon, He's also calling you to say, God, if this is truly what you want, help me to understand that. That's not putting God to the test. It's trying to confirm the call. God, what do you want me to do? I'll give you an example. I know a pastor who is in a town, and he talked to me, and, and somebody had come to him and said, you know what, our church needs to have a, a, a meal night for this community. Our church is in a, in a kind of a downtown area. There's a lot of people around there uh, that are struggling, and we should have a, like a, a dinner, a free dinner. Night. And he said, that's a great idea. He said, let's pray about it. Let's see what God has to say. About three or four days later, somebody else came up to him and said, you know, you know, this church could, could put together like a dinner program. That'd be really, really cool. He said, okay, that's interesting. Well, let's keep praying about it. And about a week later, somebody else came said, you know what, this community really needs a place where people can come get a free meal. Now, we can chalk that up to a bunch of just happenstance and coincidence, or the fact that God was sending a confirmation that, yes, this is something that you need to do. You need to devote resources to it when you make that happen. God can confirm what he needs you to do. The second way that we can understand is that God will disturb my spirit or my peace. It's however you want to say that. In Colossians 3.15 it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. We're meant to live in peace. We're meant to have a peace in our heart. Why? Because Jesus Christ has given us hope. There is peace in that. We understand where we're going because of what Jesus has done. When God needs to move you, sometimes he will disturb that peace. And he does that in, in three different ways. Number one, sometimes he's going to disturb that peace by giving you something really exciting. You ever been really excited about something? Apparently not. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> When you're excited about something, when you get an idea, you're like, man, this is going to be great. This will be awesome. Romans 12, 11, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. He'll, he'll disrupt that peace and he'll get you excited about something. And he wants you to go run with it. Okay? So some, you know, ask yourself, does it excite me? Number two, does it stretch me? Sometimes the disturbing of that spirit, of your peace, is something that makes you slightly uncomfortable. You're like, ooh, I, I don't know. Should I really do that? You really think I should go lead a group? You really think I should go out and, and, and visit these people? You think I should be the one to go do that? Are you asking, are you asking me to give more? Sometimes he's going to call you to stretch a little bit. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brothers... I do not consider that I have made it my own. I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The stretch, the strain, something that's uncomfortable, God will do that. He'll disturb your peace to say, we need, you, we need to stretch a little bit more. I 
need you to go over here. And for us, in our logic, a lot of times, we're like, whoa, hold up. You want me to go what? You want me to stretch? I don't know if I can do that. Well, maybe I can do that, but I just don't know. But that's how he'll disturb your spirit. He'll excite you sometimes. He'll stretch you sometimes. And then here's, here's this last one here about disturbing your spirit. Does it require faith? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. Is what you're being called to do going to require more than what you have? Does it seem impossible for it to happen? You can have the vision sometimes, you can have these magical ideas, but then when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of it, we're good at nuts and bolts, right? And we add it all up and we go, man, I just don't think we can get this done. This is just too much. God's always going to require him to have faith. I mean, Scripture shows you that over and over again. All the people that God has chosen to do something, they all face that question. Gideon faced that question. You want me to lead the army? Now, faith is confidence what we hope for, an assurance of what we do not see, Hebrews 11, 1. Oftentimes God is going to call you to something, and it's going to require faith. You yourself will not maybe be able to do it all on your own, but that's why God put other people in your life to come alongside you, and that's why God himself is there to help give you strength, to help give you the right words. speaking to you. Does it fit with Scripture as a whole? It's so important to go back to Scripture because Scripture is God's inspired word. And the one thing about it as a whole, it brings the same message. All the separate books written at different times, brought together, still brings you the same message. It's God's story of trying to redeem man. It's over and over again, him trying to get you to say, come to me. Let me give you peace. Let me give you a better life. Let me give you life eternal. The very nature of God and who he is, the fact that he's trustworthy, the fact that he is there, doesn't mean we always get what we want, but it is consistent. And so when you have something that is moving, think it's God's call, and you think God is calling you to something, does it go with Scripture? Does it fit in? Does it fall along with the nature of God and who He is? 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So, Three ways in which we will know God's will for our life. God will confirm it himself. He'll disturb your spirit. He'll disturb your peace. And three, does it fit the scripture as a whole? Now, the last part on, on the notes there, the last part of the sermon is just very quick and very simple. But I want you to be prepared for a couple of things. Number one probably the most important thing. You might not get the answer that you want. When you pray to God, when you're asking God for things, when you're petitioning Him, you might not always get the answer you want. Now what's the answer we all want to hear? Yes. Yes. Right? Whenever you ask somebody something, don't you want to hear yes in response? Am I a good person? <laughs> yes. She didn't have any choice. <laughs> we want to hear yes, don't we? Don't we 
want to have some sort of affirmation that yes, what we're asking for is good. Yes, this is a great idea. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you should do this. Yes, you should be here. Yes, it's going to be fine. Yes, it's going to be okay. Yes, it's glorious. We all want to hear yes. It's the other two answers we don't like to hear. No. No. You want to build that? No. Oh, you want to change that? No. You want that vacation? No. You want to spend the money on the candy bar instead of helping out the person who's struggling to find change? No. We don't want to hear no. No's not. No's never fun. But you know what? This comes back to do you trust God? Do you have faith in who God is? Should I go to the party tonight? Yes. No. But come on, God. All my friends are going to be there. It's going to be great. Let's go party. Let's go do this. It's going to be fun. I've been really good all week. I even prayed more this week. No. All my kids in the room. Oh, there's no kids in the room. Caleb, do you ever like to hear no when you want something? No. No. We like to hear no when we ask our parents for something? No. No, of course we do. And it's no different from adults when we're praying to God. We don't want to hear no either. But our faith in Jesus Christ means that we know and we have assurance that it will always turn out for good because of our faith in Him. Oh, I didn't tell you the third answer. I mean, that one's maybe even worse than no. It's like, come on, God, this really needs to happen. <gasps> Not yet, Bob. <laughs> I mean, that one's the hard one because that stresses our patience. We want it now. We want it, we want it all right now. We want, yes, oh, let's go. But sometimes things aren't ready. We might be ready. Maybe the people around us aren't quite ready yet. <laughs> Not yet's a tough one. So I want you to be prepared. You need to petition God. You need to go to God. You need to ask God, God, is this what you want? God, is this really what you're telling me? But you got to be prepared that what you want might not always be there. The second thing is be flexible. Here's a great lesson. I've come up with ideas before, and I'm like, man, this is a cool ministry. I think this would be really fun. This would be really awesome. And I come with this idea, and I present it to people, and what I had in my mind of what it was going to be, it, it doesn't look like that at all. It's almost as if I didn't even contribute to it. <laughs> but what I found was, other people saw it in different ways and had other ideas. And so from taking that idea, we morphed it a little bit this way, and then we changed it a little bit over here, and the next thing you know, we've got something that is really God-honoring, that brought a lot of people together to create something that was really good. you got to have big ideas, and you got to have ideas that are bigger than what you're capable of. That's the whole point of faith. But you've got to be flexible enough to say, you know that idea that you've got? might not look exactly like that. Because God can turn it and make it even better. And I've learned to trust that. I'm, I'm fortunate to, to have had that experience a couple times and to not take it personally. But sometimes you can take it personally. This is my idea. It was great, right? It doesn't need to prove to Paul. It's awesome. But things get considered. God knows better. Number three, remember you are seeking to know God's will. And that kind of ties back to the first two. You've got to remember, when you're going to God, you're asking for His will. What does it say in the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. At the end of the day, it's not about what we want to do. It's not about how we can fix things. It's not about how we can grow the church or anything like that. God, how do you need us to grow the church? How do you need us to serve your kingdom? That's what we have to be searching for. We need to search for it individually and collectively. And fourth, and this is the best part of all, God's plan is better than anything we can imagine. People who don't know God and don't have faith in Jesus Christ, they've told me before, what's wrong with my plans? I don't know, probably nothing, but it's not as good as what God can do. Well, why not? At the end of the day, logic speaking, his plans have to be greater than anything we can imagine. Because he created us. And he created the world we live in. I pray each and every day. I hope you do 
too, then you are seeking God's will. I hope that you are listening for it. I hope that you're looking at wherever you are in your life right now. God, how can you make me better tomorrow? How can I be a better witness tomorrow? How can I be better at what I do tomorrow? Because that's how we get closer and closer to you. <clears throat> Going back to the means of grace. Today is World Communion Sunday. And I want you to just close your eyes for a second. And I want you to think somebody you know in this community that goes to a church Wesley, Methodist, Catholic, doesn't matter. But think of somebody that you know that is in church right now someplace. Can you see them? Can you envision them in church right now? Knowing that they're getting ready to take communion or maybe they already have. Maybe they've already been there this morning. Now I want you to think of somebody down in Texas. If you don't know anybody in Texas, I want you to think about the images you saw of people who survived the hurricane and are dealing with that. And think about the people who are gathering to come together to be with God in Holy Communion. Now I want you to think about somebody in Mexico who's been dealing with the earthquake, surviving the earthquake, helping people. Think about how they are going to come to the altar of God and take communion. Think about people in small house churches in China where it's illegal. Where they can be persecuted and be thrown in jail. Think about people in the Middle East. Think about people in Africa. No matter what denomination, no matter what nationality, we are followers of Jesus Christ. And we are going to share this time today with all those people. People who sometimes we're told, ah, they're wrong in how they do it. Oh, they believe the wrong thing. Think of all these people all around the world. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another.
Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience to Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let's continue with the great thanksgiving. gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to the disciples and said, Take, and drink. Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, 